The name Hideo Kojima has become synonymous with cinematic storytelling in video games. From the stealth espionage thrills of Metal Gear to the cyberpunk noir of Snatcher, he has pushed the boundaries of interactive narratives. In 1987, Metal Gear on the MSX2 redefined the stealth genre, engaging players with its tense gameplay and rich world. Then came Snatcher in 1988, a gripping sci-fi adventure that cemented Kojima as a master storyteller, exploring the gritty underbelly of a future Neo Kobe city through the eyes of Gillian C. With Metal Gear 2 in 1990, Kojima proved his initial masterwork was no fluke. The Legend of Solid Snake and what many consider the apex of 8-bit gaming. Each new release expanded his ambition and momentum, but it was in 1994 that will mark a pivotal shift, a game where Kojima's cinematic ingenuity and creative passion co-sealed into an experience that revolutionized his approach to video game productions forever. Welcome back to the Retro Fans Retrospective. Strap in and grab your knees and shot because we're taking a deep dive into the twisting corridors and conspiratorial depths of a landmark cult classic that changed everything with Police Knots. If you're just discovering this channel, you're in for a treat. We got a growing catalog of captivating retrospectives that peel back the layers on gaming's most fascinating and influential titles. From unsung gems to celebrated classics, our deep dives offer fresh perspectives that'll ignite your passion for the art form. If you enjoy an engaging retrospective that blends insightful analysis with the reverence for its subject matter, mash that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. You won't want to miss our upcoming aspirations to the brilliant minds and landmark experiences that has shaped the incredible medium. Let's dive into this. To truly understand the genesis of Police Knots, we must go back to Kojima's previous opus, Snatcher. While developing that cyberpunk masterpiece in 1988, technical issues forced his team to take a break. It was during this downtime that Kojima's inquisitive mind began to wander down new creative avenues. Questions like, what would happen if humans ventured into space? And how would zero gravity affect the human body and relationships started percolating? These thoughts didn't emerge in a vacuum, however. Kojima has always drawn inspiration from the world around him, weaving real-life events and societal issues into his rich narrative tapestries. For Police Knots, three pivotal occurrences in the early 90s helped form the core of his bold new vision. First was the historic 1990 voyage of Tahiro Akiyama, the first Japanese citizen in space. This opened the floodgates for Kojima to devour NASA documentation, fueling his fascination with the physiological and psychological tools of space travel. Suddenly, the setting for his next cyber thriller took shape among the stars. Simultaneously, the controversial topics of organ transplants and donations were making waves following the major medical milestones in 86 and 92. Ethical quandaries surrounding these procedures ignited public discourse right with moral ambiguity further ground for Kojima's thought-provoking narratives to explore. Finally, the 1993 film Rising Sun with its negative depictions of Japanese culture sparked outrage and accusations of Japan bashing. In an interview in 1996, he stated, The story itself is something I thought of in the 90s in response to two things. First was the release of the movie Rising Sun and the outburst of Japan bashing that it caused. While controversial, it planted the seed for Kojima's signature buddy cop dynamic, taking social cues from Starsky and Hutch and Lethal Weapon. With pieces spanning scientific frontiers, modern medicine, moral dilemmas, and Asian American tensions, the thematic foundation was laid for what would become a widely innovative and visionary new journey into interactive pop boiler territory. With his bold sci-fi vision crystallized, it was time for Kojima to bring police knots to life. However, this would be a pioneering journey unlike any of his previous games, 
For the first time, he will not be constrained to limitations of the MSX hardware. Police not smart, Kojima transitioned to full creative control. While he had a development team, Kojima took an unprecedented hands-on role, virtually spearheading every aspect himself. As he put it, I did most of the game design, huge dialogue, ADV scripts, using simple language, storyboards, guessing, flag management, including the drawings, calling out the sounds. This was no mere game, but Kojima's first true independent movie brought to interactive life. Even naming the project proved challenging initially. Kojima wanted to simply call it Beyond, to encapsulate its exploratory boundary-pushing themes. However, trademark conflicts led to the title Police Knots, arguably a more fitting moniker for the twisting sci-fi caper that awaited. Development proceeded on the NEC PC-9821, a home computer that finally gave Kojima's vibrant vision the colorful canvas it deserved. After a grueling four-year production cycle that Kojima has sucked up the most difficult work to produce, Police Knots made its world premiere on July 29, 1994. However, the road didn't end there. As technology rapidly evolved, Police Knots was subsequently re-released for the 3DO, Sony PlayStation, and Sega Saturn over the next few years to reach new audiences. But in a bizarre turn, the game initially remained exclusive to Japan. Its revolutionary blend of cinematic storytelling and mature themes locked away from Western audiences. It wouldn't be until a fan translation group remarkably localized it in 2009 that the wider world could finally experience this hugely influential missing link in Kojima's trajectory towards video game storytelling. Here's a quick spoiler as I'm about to tell the story of Police Knots and a little bit of Snatcher. If you're not a fan of spoilers, please advance to the gameplay overview section as seen on the timeline below. Let's dive into this. Like its cyberpunk predecessor Snatcher, Police Knots unfolds its narrative across the epic act structure. We embark in the year 2010 amidst mankind's first bold steps into stellar colonization, the unveiling of Beyond Coast, a groundbreaking space habitat. To maintain order on this extraterrestrial frontier, a specialized security force was carefully assembled. Five elite police officers, Gates Becker, Joseph Sudoki Tokugawa, Salvatore Tuscani, Ed Brown, and Jonathan Ingram, underwent grueling astronaut training to cross-pollinate the duties of law enforcement and space exploration. Collectively, they were christened themselves as Police Knots. Just three years into their mission, tragedy stuck during a routine test of an experimental EPMS suit. Jonathan Ingram was violently separated from his crew, cast adrift a cosmic void, fast forwarding 25 years to 2038. Ingram's fate took a surprising turn when the unnamed exploration vessel Propaganda discovered his long dormant life pod. Miraculously recovered from cryogenic sleep, Ingram emerged from Purgatory's embrace like an archaeological relic of a bygone era. Ingram's return to reality was a disorienting journey. It took him a year to regain basic bodily functions and two more years to piece together some semblance of his former self. Yet, the harsh reality remained. 27 years in stasis had erased his previous existence. His friends, his wife, his career, all lost. Left with no clear direction, he reluctantly became a private negotiator, dealing with society's outcasts. Though far from his police not days, his new role satisfied his pursuit of justice. His office became a tomb of his past. There were remnants like old photos of his wife Lorraine and his retired badge, fragments of his lost identity. There sat Jonathan Ingram, passing time in his DeRay office, awaiting the next case, and then a specter from his past emerged, 
none other than his long lost wife Lorraine. Despite the decades that aged her, Ingram instantly recognized her. Lorraine revealed her urgent reason for seeking him out. Her husband, Kenzo Hojo, had been kidnapped. With trembling hands, she provided two meager clues, a bicycle leaf and some pill capsules. Ingram faced a brutal choice to help the woman who once abandoned him or sever the remaining ties to his past. Adding to the complexity, Lorraine disclosed that she had a daughter named Karen Hojo who was gravely ill and worked as a news anchor on Beyond, the very colony Ingram had once safeguarded. Jonathan's demeanor remained cold and he let Lorraine leave. But as she departed, a car bomb intended for her detonated, throwing her back towards the office in a violent shockwave. The blast marked the beginning of a tangled web of injury and danger that would engulf Ingram's life once again. Lorraine, I wanted to Ingram burst outside, pistol drawn, desperately firing shot after shot at the fleeing bomber. He tore down the neon drenched alleyway in pursuit, with that pounding against the bizarre trail of white blood left in the assailant's wake. But the mysterious attacker was too quick, deftly mounting a getaway motorcycle and peeling away into the night, leaving Ingram cursing his name in the vacant shadows. As a frantic adrenaline finally drained, a grim reality set in. Ingram returned to the smoldering crater of the blast site, Lorraine's broken body cradled in his arms. With her fleeting breaths, she managed one final reason plea for him to save her deathly ill daughter, Cameron, who lived on beyond. But she never got the crucial details of what affliction this poor woman suffered from. Lorraine's eyes were blank mid-sentence, her tragic story forever unfinished. In that moment, any doubts Ingram harbored over aiding this long estranged wife were erased. He had to see this through and unravel the mystery she died trying to solve. Still in this resolve, Ingram booked passage to the very colony he had sworn to protect decades ago, beyond coast, where the shady amenities of Lorraine's new life and possibly the key to her daughter's salvation awaited his presence. <laughs> ロレイ。During his journey to beyond, Ingram encountered Tony Redwood, a pale, ethereal figure with vibrant purple hair and pupilless eyes, his arm wrapped in bandages hinting at hidden traumas. Tony, a frozener, which is an artificially conceived human with genetic enhancements for space life, exuded an unworldly aura, his veins pumping eerie white blood. As they converse, Tony shared tales of his life on beyond, revealing the harsh realities faced by the frozener race. Ingram's apprehensions over his return grew with each revelation, pondering what other unfathomable wonders and threats awaited his long overdue homecoming. As the journey progressed, the toll of space travel began weighing heavily on Ingram's earthly body. Disorienting bouts of nausea set in, forcing him to request medication from the stewardess. Unsettingly, the pill she provided looked similar to the cryptic capsule Lorraine had left behind as a clue. 
Turning on the TV to catch the latest news feeds from beyond, Ingram discovered that Lorraine's daughter Karen was the news anchor. Her reports laid bare, distressing the underbelly of the colony, including a rapid black market with a highly addictive drug, narc, and a worsening worldwide organ shortage that is berating life on beyond. Eventually, the cap started to take effect and Jonathan slept the rest of the ride until he reached beyond, ending the prologue. フライト中に体外へ流出した体液を補給するようご利用くださいフライト中に体外へ流出した体液を補給するようご利用くださいフライト中に体外へ流出した体液を補給するようご利用くださいフライト中に体外へ流出した体液を補給するようご利用ください
Upon arrival, they encounter a hazard door blocking their access into the laboratory, frustrating their attempts to uncover the truth. However, the diligent guard on duty leads them to Hojo's office where they uncover a startling revelation. On the 15th, Hojo was scheduled to release 100 sets of K9 to the BCCH, Beyond's Hospital. This discovery deepens the mystery surrounding Hojo's disappearance and hints at a potentially sinister connection between his research and the troubling events unfolding in Beyond. Jonathan and Ed journey to the BCCH where they encounter Chris Goldwyn, the hospital's director. She's holding a purse with a nanomachine robot called a Mosquito. Recognizing them as former police knots, Chris shares her admiration for their past exploits, reminiscing about her teenage years spent idolizing them. With Chris's help, the duo delves into inquiries about Hojo and the intricacies of organ transplantations, particularly the profound effects of space in the human body. Chris directs them to her employee, June Ishida, in the pharmacy, where they unearth shocking revelations. He shot a review that the 15th marked the last contact he had with Hojo regarding K-9. Hojo had delivered three sets which contradicts the records found in Hojo's office, with 97 sets of K-9 missing and the developed K-9 vanished. Jonathan and Ed find themselves ensnared in a labyrinth of deception and intrigue. In a poignant turn of events, the duo ventures to Karen's home, where they are met by a grieving Karen consumed by anguish and blame towards Jonathan for her mother's fate. Ed steps in offering words of reassurance that ultimately coax Karen into setting aside her emotions and aiding the investigation. Karen confides in them about her battle with aplastic anemia, a condition deliberating her ability to produce new blood. As they explore the house, they stumble upon Hojo's CD collection, discovering a mysterious disc that refuses to play. Intrigued, they proceed to Hojo's study, where they uncover an ID card and a list of elms bearing family crests. With each revelation, the mystery deepens drawing them closer to unraveling the truth behind Hojo's disappearance. As they bid farewell, Karen begins to find solace and forgiveness in her heart, gladly accepting Jonathan and his quest for justice. あなたも安全とはいえ何かあればすぐ the duo ventures to the Tokugawa building to meet with former police not Tokugawa. Upon inquiry with receptionists, they uncover a startling detail. Hojo checked into the building on the 15th and never checked out. This revelation fueled their investigation's urgency, igniting a burning desire to uncover the truth behind Hojo's mysterious disappearance. As they navigate through the building, they stumble upon a lavish party in the garden, teeming with call girls, EMPSs, and mafia members, their presence noted for further investigation. Amidst the festivities, Tokugawa, accompanied by former police Nas Salvatore and hospital director Chris, entered the scene. Jonathan confronts Tokugawa about Hojo's vanishing act. But the conversation quickly turns tense, with Tokugawa showing confusion and intending to deflect Jonathan's questions. As tensions escalate, a heated argument erupts between Tokugawa and Jonathan, culminating in a dramatic confrontation that sees the two forced to be separated and Jonathan being kicked out of the party, marking the conclusion to Act 1. <laughs>今の私はポリスノーツの頃の私ではない。徳川グループをこの宇宙を動かす徳川だ。脅しか。脅しではない。情けだよ。同じポリスノーツとしてのな。お前はもうポリスノーツじゃない。金と権力に溺れる猛者
and his adopted son, Mark, each holding a piece of Ed's terminus past. Jonathan is drawn into Ed's world, learning about the tragedy that befell his wife, Catherine, in needing a kidney transplant and the heartbreaking circumstance that led to Mark's adoption. The weight of Mark's silence, a reminder of a past filled with unspeakable pain, hangs heavy in the air. Despite the somber backdrop, Jonathan immersed himself in Ed's history, having dinner with his newfound family. Amidst the intimate setting of dinner, a pivotal phone call erupts to tranquility, plunging Jonathan and Ed into a whirlwind of intrigue. A message gets relayed to Ed. The caller, known as Nine Stars, possesses information about Hojo, beckoning Ed to the Astronaut Memorial Museum. With a sense of apprehension tinged with curiosity, Jonathan and Ed hasten from the Brown residence and heed Nine Star summons. At the museum, Nine Stars materializes, shrouded in mystery and clad in a spacesuit, a symbol of their enigmatic persona. With veiled words, Nine Stars unravels a web of deceit, revealing Hojo's demise as punishment for betrayal, his involvement in the Calistine world of narc sales. The shocking revelation extends to Lorraine's untimely death, implicating an elusive group shrouded in the shadows. As the truth unfurls, Nine Stars and Potter quickly message to secure a damning CD containing irrefutable evidence that will verify this information. いいか、覚えたか。カモンチェックで Armed with their new info, the duo heads back to Hojo's place to grab that crucial CD Nine Stars had mentioned. But when they get to Hojo's office at Tokugawa Pharmaceuticals, it's like something out of a spy movie. Hojo's computer is gone. The board with all the info on K9 from the 15th has been wiped clean. It's like someone's trying to sweep things under the rug. So they figure, why not check the hospital's computer instead? Going to the hospital, they find Chris still burning the midnight oil. After a quick catch up, they spill the beans and ask for her help. Thankfully, she agrees, and they get into the hospital pharmacy to check out the disc where they find everything Nine Star said checked out. As it turns out, K9 has got a sneaky trick up his sleeve. K9 is actually a cover up for Narc, and you need to pop two capsules together to get the full effect. If you take one alone, there's no dice. So, those pills with the missing Togawa symbols was half of the Narc puzzle. <laughs> K シリーズ中心に提供してまいりました。K1 しかし、今回のKシリーズの最新作DDS ナークつまり内容物を変えることで流通経路はどのようにもなります。内容物に
いくらカプセル側に NARC をプログラムしたところで公的な市場で流通させるにはあまりにも危険ですそこで徳川の最新テクノロジーは NARC そのものを科学的に2つに分離することに成功これらを別々のカプセルにプログラムすることによりこれらのカプセルを同時に服用して初めて NARC の効果が得られるようにしたわけです私どもではこれをバイナリー麻薬と呼んでおりますカプセル自体へのプログラム AB2 つのカプセル同時服用という2ランクの安全システムにより偽装効果はほぼ完璧となりますこれでもう麻薬取り締まりによる妨害も損失も恐れる必要はなくなりましたしかもナークカプセルは無重量化でも均等に素早く溶解する性質を持っております宇宙での使用も問題ありませんそれでは次に AB の分離されたカプセルの見分け方をご説明しましょうその見分け方はいとも簡単それぞれのカプセル表面には製材識別コードを兼ねた目印がつけてありますこの徳川のマークが目印となります徳川の三つ葉葵の一部が欠けているのがお分かりでしょうこの欠けた部分を持つカプセルを割り符のように対にして服用するとナークとして作用する仕組みとなっていますこれらはそれぞれ片方だけを服用してもナークの作用は全く現れませんしたがって危惧される一般市場での事故は心配ありません組み合わせのキャッチは徳川を一つにですそしてこの携帯ではあらゆる麻薬探知機にも反応しません現存する探知機ではこれらを探知することは不可能なのですいかがですこれが徳川のハイテクノロジーが生んだ DDS K9 ナークカプセルです我々はナークカプセルを自信を持ってお送りしますどうぞこの K9 をあなたの取引に利用してみてください皆様の良きご理解を期待しておりますデカチョ、ジョナサン、パイオニア10号のナインスターズってやつから伝言があったわ。パイオニア10号やつだ。あの AMM のタレコミや。状況が変わった。今日のビヨンド時間04時に例のパイオニア前へ来いって。女の声だったわ。女の声映像はあい,いえ、音声信号だけだったわ。プロテクトされてたから録音もできなかったし奴は女だったわからない機械的に音声を返上してたかもしれない最近のプロテクトって強烈なんだ BCP なんかより一般の技術の方が進んでるんだホームなまりはそういえばあったかもそうかどうしたエドいや一つ気になることがま、い、エド、今度こそ奴を捕まえようぜ。ナークカプセルがなくなった今、頼りは奴しかいない。デカ長、そろそろ僕らの出番かなま、待ってろ。ジョナさん、いつでもいいよ。あんたの助けなら、いつでも OK さ。ありがとう、デイブ。その時は頼む。ああ、任せてくれ。Arriving at the museum, they're greeted by a chilling sight. 
the police knots wax figures of Jonathan and Ed's heads brutally severed, sending a grim message. Following the rendezvous point, they stumble upon a disturbing scene, an astronaut suit missing a head. The duo then finds a head infested with mosquitoes. As the insects disperse, they uncover a shocking revelation. The decapitated head belongs to none other than Jin Shada, the pharmaceutical engineer from the hospital. <laughs> The mosquitoes begin trying to attack the duo. Battling and swarming mosquitoes, they scramble to find a way out, searching desperately for something emitting CO2 to distract the insects. Spotting a fire hydrant, they move towards it, only to be confronted by a mysterious figure in an astronaut suit. Jonathan swiftly takes down the unknown assailant and grabs the hydrant, hurling it at the coral rocks. With the shot from his gun, they divert the mosquitoes' attention away from them. Outside, as they review their notes, they discover someone lurking beneath their car. Confronting the person, he swiftly mounts a motorcycle and leads them on a wild chase through town. Racing after him, they reach the train station where Ed coordinates with Dave and Merrill to set up a checkpoint at the next train stop. Boarding a train, they find the passengers acting strangely. Amidst the confusion, a young boy in a biker helmet distracts them, allowing the real culprit to escape. Following the man to the next train, they spot him holding a hostage. It's Chris, and as they look into the eyes of the masked man, they realize it's Tony Redwood from AP. After a tense standoff, Tony releases Chris and flees. With Chris holding them up, Tony is at the checkpoint that Ed has set up and shoots and kills Dave. The duo arrives to find Dave's lively body and continues to chase after Tony. However, their pursuit is halted when a woman warns them of a bomb planted by him. Desperate to defuse it, they locate the person containing the bomb and manage to disarm it just in time. Suddenly, the EMPS has arrived, but Dave's body is surprisingly missing, leaving them stunned. The sight of blood on the officer's knee hints at an ominous turn of events, closing this act. Entering Act 3 titled Drug, tensions rise as Becker, frustrated with Jonathan and Ed's actions, confiscates Jonathan's gun and orders Ed to take a break from the department. AP is tasked with handling the Hojo case now leaving them with one final chance to prove themselves, albeit stricken by the book. However, the discovery that the attacker's body has vanished, leaving only a shadow behind, adds to the mystery. Despite informing the chief about Redwood, they are met with indifference, being told they need concrete evidence to pursue Tokugawa farther. Back at Vice, they find Meryl grieving over Dave's death and questioning why his body is missing. She suggests contacting Victor for an autopsy on Ashita's body. At forensics, they find Victor, who is also expressing his sadness over Dave's demise. Jonathan inquires about Redwood being a Frozener and how he could withstand so many shots. Victor explains that Froseners using artificial blood can endure more damage, especially if there are heavy narc users, requiring more bullets to take them down. Leaving Victor's office, the duo returns to Tuckerdow's Pharmaceuticals and uses Hoda's ID card to access the locked back room where they discover a black poppy field, the main ingredient in narc. They find machines processing the poppy seeds into NARC and the pill capsules missing half of the Tokugawa symbol. Armed with this evidence, they report to the chief who mobilizes all units to apprehend Tokugawa. Upon their return to the building with a warrant, they find everything has been switched back within just four hours. The poppy seeds are gone, the capsules bear the full Tokugawa symbol again. In a shocking turn of events, they discover Hojo's lifeless body in the back with fresh blood indicating a recent demise. The EMPS team determines that he was killed no more than four hours ago. Security footage, DNA analysis, and examination of the murder weapon, a recoil pistol, revealed a damning revelation. The pistol matched Jonathan Ingram's. 
Gates accuses Jonathan of the murders of Ken Hojo, Lorraine Hojo, and Janishata, branding his investigation as a ruse to frame him. Jonathan, realizing Gates and Tokugawa's collision, witnesses the extent of conspiracy as Tokugawa orchestrated the cover-up. Jonathan is subsequently arrested, being framed for crimes he did not commit. <laughs> それに弁護士を接見する権利がある。弁護士の費用が払えない場合は感染弁護人をつけることができる。ジョナサン、おとなしくしておればよかったのだ。もう少し賢い男だと思ったが。ホムソ。本部長、本部長のAIDカードとCDロムを持っています。よろしい、証拠品だ。押収しろ。それから、本部長夫妻の写真も持っています。殺した人間の写真か？それも押収したまえ。ケイス、佐藤、ひるさん、ジョナサン
With these revelations, the call concludes, leaving Jonathan to grapple with the weight of the newfound truths. <laughs> いいか、ジョナサン。BCCHだ。Karen overhearing the conversation asked Jonathan to take her with him to the hospital so she can find her dad's body. He lets her tag along for the investigation, ending this act. だから時間を無駄にしたくない。彼。あなたと一緒にいたいの。母の分まで。それに、BCCHは私詳しいのよ。3日に1度は通ってるから案内できる。ああ。ジョナサン。大丈夫なのか。体の具合良くないんだろ
メリルに護衛させようしっかり頼む俺たちがビヨンドにいるように細工してくれ分かったわ何とかやってみる BBC の CG チームに相談してみるわしばらくの間なら CG 合成でごまかせるはずナークカプセルの件はほんのきっかけに過ぎんかもしれん石田の言っていたもっと恐ろしいことの意味かビクトルはどうするここに置いていくのか俺たちで葬ってやりたいが今はどうにもできんじいさんすまない先生必ず迎えに来る<笑>とにかく付き合いだ In Act 5 Lunar, Jonathan and Ed stealthily infiltrate the Tokugawa moon plant, where a presentation by Salvatore is underway. Waiting for the opportune moment, they slip away unnoticed once Salvatore's speech concludes. Inside the facility, marked with the Tokugawa request and guarded by EPMF suits, they use Hojo's ID to gain access, only to discover a grim scene biomorphs scattered everywhere, including the bodies of Hojo and Dave. Hojo's body miraculously intact despite the shooting reveals a sinister truth, a well executed cover up to preserve his vital organs. Dave scars hints at a similar fate, his kidneys likely harvested it for the black market. As they delve deeper, they uncover a Calistine organ trading operation facilitated by the Biomorts as unwilling donors. Their findings lead to a chilling confrontation with Salvatore, who brazenly confesses to orchestrating the scheme for decades. In a shocking revelation, he confesses the police knots were involved in Jonathan Path's accident, deactivating the safety protocols. Shibaraku buri da na, Jonah san, Edo. Konna tokoro de aeru to wa omoa na katta yo. Sono koe wa? So da, watashi da yo. Hiyo koso o futari san, Gez Sekai, Serenos Fea e. サルバトレ貴様も徳川の犬とはなここで何をしてる見ての通りさホームやビヨンドからバイオモートを買い取りここで保存我々の臓器配分ネットワークとリンク電話一本で全世界への臓器提供を行っている商品には専門の処理と加工を施してなそのための専門医を抱えているどこの国の政府機関もできないことを我々がしている臓器の密売用かホームのマフィアや組織にナクを提供する代わりに彼らから健康な死体をもらう人身売買誘拐殺人バイオモートの入手方法は彼らが決める地球で頻発してる幼児誘拐はこのためか君らが必死になって追っていたナークカプセルは単なる彼らへのサービスの一つに過ぎ腑に落ちんななぜ黒消しの栽培だけをビヨンドでするここで栽培すれば安全なはずいい質問だこの月面ではここでは黒消しは身をつけんのだよ黒消しのような繊細な種の栽培は無理だ重力生物学はまだ現象を説明することしかできないそれでビヨンド内で栽培をサルバトーレ自分が何をしてるか分かってるのか分かってるさ事前事業だ誰もができないことを我々がやってるもちろん金はいただくがね宇宙開発の陰にはドラッグと臓器が必要だ人類は宇宙環境に適応できない漆黒の宇宙空間あの孤立感選ばれて訓練されたものでも頭がおかしくなるジョナさんお前もよく理解できるだろう薬なしのクリーンな宇宙旅行はせいぜいこの月までだだから許されるというのかたかが麻薬だ
我々は麻薬がなければ生きてゆけんのだそして降り注ぐ宇宙船無重量人体や遺伝子にさまざまな影響が出る薬と同様宇宙開発には臓器のスペアが必要なんだ見ろこのバイオモート人類のスペア部品だ宇宙開発で傷つき病んだ我々を救ってくれるここは6分の1時バイオモートの保存に持ってこいだホームだと床ずれの心配がある逆に無重量だと臓器の機能が弱るまさに月は臓器保存に最適の地なんだ刈り取った商品は加工した後に月資源に混ぜてマスドライバーで送る加工臓器移植といってもさまざまなケースがある我々は必要な臓器を必要な状態に加工してすぐ移植できるようにしている高齢者や感染症を起こしているバイオモート以外は全てここへ送られるじゃあなぜビクトルのような高齢者をふんバイオモートの利用方法は移植用臓器や血液の保存のみではない北条やビクトルのような高齢者のバイオモートは希少なホルモンなどの生産や新薬開発用の実験体として使われる若い女のバイオモートは人工子宮として子供を産むこともできるもう代理母の必要もない北条は特異的な血液型所有者なので血液の生産用に保存しているに臓器が不足している毎日のようにニュースではその話題だどうだね宇宙医学のために十分なっているだろうなえどお前も我々の臓器ネットワークの存在を知っていれば女房は助かったのになキャサリン宇宙開発とドラッグそして将来的なドナーの欠乏そこにいち早く目をつけたのが徳川だ奴はこのことを30年前に予測していた救世主サルバドール気取りだなサルバトーレ今から30年前ポリスノーツとしてビヨンドへ派遣された時徳川からこの計画を持ちかけられた徳川ゲイツそして私は徳川の財力とコネクションさらに BCP を操作してビヨンドに君臨する策略を練ったその長期にわたる計画にはエドとジョナサンお前らのような金と権力に欲のない道徳論者が邪魔だったまさかあの事故なんてことだ30年前のエンプスユーリーの暴走事故徳川の命令で私が細工した。事故後、救助活動を遅らせるようにしたのはゲイツだ。あれが、人為的な事故。しかし、貴様が生きていようとは、しぶといやつだ。すでに我々の計画は成功し、システムは起動している。今となっては、お前らがどう叫ぼうとびくともせんが徳川を怒らせてしまったからな始末せねばならんさればとれエドジョナサ悲しい顔をするなお前たちを見送った後すぐにでもお前たちの家族や仲間たちに会わしてやるあの世でなしまったマークやアナもお前らプラトー・クレーターの語源を知ってるかギリシャ神話のプルトンそうプルトンとは止めるものの意味だがギリシャ・ローマ神話のプルトンは冥界の間つまりあの世ビヨンドのな我々を象徴するにはぴったりの地名だそしてお前たちも
の倍をもうとのようにここで眠ることになる今年者と聖者とをつなぐこのプラトンの地でなくそエドビヨンドへ戻ろうそいつに頼ってもダメだそこの腰抜けは銃が撃てないんだFollowing Salvatore's lengthy confession, a shootout ensues between him and Jonathan, resulting in Salvatore's demise. With the danger seemingly over, Ed and Jonathan head outside where they take care of the EPMS suits that started attacking them. Now, faced with the challenge of leaving the moon, they discover that their best option is to hop onto a pod and drift back to beyond. Amidst the tension of uncertainty, they eventually decide to take the risk and embark on a journey back to beyond, which ends this act. ジョーナさん、早く乗れこれに人が乗ったことがあるのかこれから俺たちが乗るのさよく分かった行くぞ、ジーに備えろやっぱりやめた方が良かったもう遅い、生きていたら L2 で会おう Moving on to the next chapter, Biomort. Jonathan and Ed return from the moon only to be met with distressing news. Ed's son, Mark, has been kidnapped. They receive a chilling message scrawled in frozen or blood, demanding their presence at the museum to retrieve Mark. Unsure what to expect, Karen offers her help by monitoring the museum through news cameras. Since Jonathan is still wanted, he stays hidden with Karen while Meryl and Ed take the lead. Suddenly, Redwood disguised as a biker. Is spotted on camera. Jonathan alerts the team, but by the time they arrive, Redwood has vanished. They spot the astronaut holding Mark's hand. Despite hesitation, Ed rushes in, only to be shot. Jonathan attempts to pursue Redwood, but Karen's illness overwhelms her, causing her to collapse, allowing Redwood to escape. In the hospital, Ed lies in the ICU, surrounded by loved ones. Meryl, Mark, Anna, and Chris keep vigilant watch over him. With Ed in capable hand, Jonathan rushes to Karen's side, only to receive devastating news from the attending doctor. Karen urgently needs a bone marrow transplant, and her best hope lies in finding a suitable donor. Since Karen is the only child and both her parents are gone, no one else would have her HLA, as they would need to be a direct relative. To Jonathan's surprise, Gates Becker, the chief of police, shares Karen's HLA site and could potentially save her life. However, despite the doctor's pleas, Gates adamantly refuses to undergo the procedure. Desperate to save Karen, the doctor turns to Jonathan, asking if he can persuade Gates to reconsider. In a last ditch effort, Jonathan agrees to undergo testing to determine if he could be a match, knowing that time is of the essence. So, this is the あなたの HLA 型も調べさせてくださいああ気休めだがすぐ終わりますこの血液を用意してある個体を使って HLA の番号を調べるだけです HLA 型の検査は約5時間ほどで終わります実際に骨髄を抜くときは少し辛い思いをしますがねえ<笑>そんなに心配しなくてもいいですよ今は採取した骨髄細胞を人工培養して56倍に増やすことができるようになりましたから献血程度で済みます
As Jonathan anxiously awaits the results of his blood test, Anna bursts in the room accompanied by Meryl and Mark. Mark, with a determined expression, reveals a startling discovery that he made on his drawing. A photo of the mysterious biker, the astronaut, and an unexpected element, a lavender flower. This revelation triggers a cascade of memories, prompting Mark to recount the tragic events that led to his adoption. Five years earlier, Ed, while on duty, had fatally shot Mark's father, a victim of a narcotic addiction, right before Mark's eyes, a trauma that still haunts him to this day, explaining Ed's aversion to using firearms. To everyone's astonishment, Mark's father was revealed to be none other than Riley Redwood, Tony's older twin brother. This revelation sheds new light on Ed's restrained reaction when Mark was kidnapped. With this newfound information and the enigmatic lavender flower as a clue, Jonathan pieces together the puzzle, suspecting that the individual in the astronaut suit might be none other than Chris, the hospital director. そう、でも、この頃にで香水つけてたもの。まさかあのクリスさんがでもこの頃にで香水つけてる人なんて他にいないわ。しまった。どうして気がつかなかったんだ。マークは知ってたのね。それで。マスイは彼女でかちょうの
ていたいのか知ってる誰も俺を殺すことはできないのさジョナサン・イングラム Following Redwood's defeat, Jonathan navigates his way to the garden where he encounters Becker encased in an MPS suit. Becker, knowing Tokugawa's absence, goads Jonathan into action, daring him to pull the trigger. However, Jonathan's firearm proves ineffective in the weightlessness of zero gravity, leaving him vulnerable, seizing the opportunity. Becker unleashes a barrage of bullets, skillfully avoiding vital organs, as he reveals his sinister plan to harvest Jonathan's organs for profit on the black market. Confessing to his crimes in the dark dealings of beyond, Becker's admission is broadcasted unknowingly to the public. But just as Becker prepares to deliver a fatal blow, a gunshot shatters the tense silence. Ed emerges swiftly, dispatching Becker with a precise shot to the temple. As they descend the stairs, they are surrounded by Tokugawa's forces and AP, poised to unleash havoc. Until reinforcements arrive just in the nick of time, with Meryl and the BCP intervening. Ed delivers the momentous news to Jonathan. He can provide Karen the bone marrow she needs to survive. Ending this act. Jonathan, Karen's cut throat is not good. No, Ed. ゲイツの腐った骨髄などいらんさいそうじゃないんだジョナサンそこで止まれ<笑>私を舐めるなと言っただろう徳川放送局は我々が抑えたこれが最後だ諦めろジョナサンやれ動かないでみんな来てくれたわあんたら見直したよあんたらは本物のポリスノーツだバカな何のつもりだあんたももう終わりよこのビルの周りは警官隊とマスコミが取り囲んでいるわデカチョ<笑>いいですかジョナサンあなたの骨髄でカレンさんは助かります頑張ってください The tale culminates in an epilogue titled Knots The news broadcast reverberate Tokugawa's indominus downfall exposing his crimes of narc trafficking, organ trafficking and solicitation of murder Jonathan and Ed bid their farewells exchanging heartfelt sentiments before parting ways Ed and Trud Jonathan win a letter Pinned by Karen, invoking a flood of emotions. In a point of exchange, Jonathan presents Ed with a cherished drawing from Mark, affirming their bond as family. With final embrace, they bid each other adieu. Amidst the journey home, Jonathan glimpses a new segment showcasing Karen, now thriving with a radiant smile and stylish new haircut. As he reads Karen's letter, gratitude washes over him, culminating in an unexpected revelation she regards him as her father. The truth unravels. Jonathan's blood tests reveal his true relationship with Karen, affirming their familiar connection. Armed with this newfound knowledge, Jonathan embarks on his journey homeward, bringing closure to this tale of unforeseen twists and enduring bonds. Sakuya, Tokugawa Group, Third Member, Gen Tokugawa Group, Sousai, No Joseph Sadaoki Tokugawa, Ga Naku Mayaku. および臓器密売殺人教唆の容疑で検察庁に送検されましたなお爆発のあった徳川ビルブロックは現在ご覧のように折れ曲がっていますが調査当局によりますと崩壊の心配はないとのことですビヨンドへの影響もありません付近住民への避難勧告も解除されましたまるでこの支柱は今回の徳川グループを象徴するようです
この事件によりこれからの宇宙開発に大きな問題提起がなされたことになります CM に引き続き BBC ではこの事件の報道特番をお送りいたしますこれから忙しくなるなエド定年はお預けだが無理はするなよああ気のいいところを見計らってやめればいいさジョーさんうんいやいいんだこれカレンから預かったものだ機内で開けてくれそうかエド俺もお前に渡すものがあるんだなんだこれさ見てみろよここれはマークがああ俺の顔俺のエドもう大丈夫だよマークはお前を理解してるジョーさんありがとうありがとうエドエド話してくれないかじゃあなエド元気だなジョーさんもういいところだこっちに残らんかいやここに俺の居場所はない行くよエドそうかジョナサンジョナサン俺たちはいいパートナーだったよなあ,あ最高の友達さジョナサン友達に忠告しとくタバコはやめるんだぞジョナサンジョまで及んだ徳川グループの汚職事件は今後の宇宙開発に大きな課題を残すことになりましたなお徳川事件以来しばらく休養していた私カレン北条も今日から元気に仕事に復帰いたしましたこれからも変わらず頑張っていきたいと思います応援してくださいコリンズ博士から全てを聞きました私なんて言ったらいいかありがとう私はいつもパパのそばにいますあなたの娘カレン追伸忘れ物よ探偵さんママに叱られるわよ With police knocks, Hideo Kojima compels us to stay directly into the existential unknown, looming before humanity as we pursue our destiny as cosmic wanderers. As he contemplated, what will happen if humans go into space? What effect will living in space have on the human body and relationships? This journey goes beyond mere science fiction. It delves headfirst into the churning cosmic turmoil at the edges of our species, vast future potential. At the heart of this interstellar struggle lies the unavoidable question Kojima hopes to examine. What unchanging aspects of human nature will be revealed in this new environment? He sought to analyze the forced transformation of our physical and psychological selves in adapting to realms where all natural laws, order, and contextual grounding become meaningless. Through the shattered, drifting perspective of Jonathan Ingram, We viscerally understand the insidious isolation of this sterile exile. Kojima states, I wanted to realistically examine a future that is a little nearer to us. And in breaking Ingram down to his most primal elements, he immerses us in a fever dream of the existential self alienation awaiting any soul unhithered from the nurturing embrace of Earth. Yet, 
this introspective horror serves as a gateway to the grander cosmic uncertainties Police Not challenges us to confront. Her Kojima's ambition to create a game that will have a small but positive effect on players' actual lives. What ethical storms gather as humanity's rapid expansion reaches escape velocity? Will our flawed civilization merely birth new afflictions to corrupt the pristine galactic stream? With each celestial mile conquered, Police Not dares us to navigate the labyrinth of human ideologies and moral principles being pitlessly dismantled by the void's remorselessness, anthropic dismissal only by contemplating these visceral, terrifyingly plausible eventualities can we steer our starward path true or careen into the same soulless abyss that consumed Ingram as Kojima whole players will ponder what life will be like in space. At its heart, Police Knots is a searing look at lives shattered by unimaginable loss and the eternal struggle to reclaim one's sense of self from the wreckage. Jonathan Ingram is literally a man in tune in his past, his 27 year drift through the void, leaving him without identity, a hollow shell haunted by memories of the life he once knew. As he embarks on this cosmic journey a to atone for the sins he failed to confront, Jonathan must claw his way out of that self-imposed purgatory, each revelation, each hard-won victory chips away at the shell of despair and guilt, encasing the proud police knot he once was. It's an odyssey of transformation to resurrect the semblance of the man buried so rebirth and reclaimed purpose can finally be attained, and Jonathan is far from alone from being deformed by the gravitational forces of tragedy. His former comrade, Ed Brown, is the embodiment of greatness collapsed into insecurity's black hole. Constant reminders of his glory days torment Ed, feeding the cycle of self-loathing that clouds his once unshakable heroic conventions. Only by staring his darkest shames in the face, flaws and all, Ed can hope to escape this psychic eclipse. For both men, the road towards redemption is fraught, oftentimes few gauntlet, two lives in dire need of cosmic undertakings grand enough to channel their rolling inner chaos into clarity, renewed, reactualized self. Police Not strips away these characters' identities down to their most primal elements so that they, like newborn celestial bodies, may gradually accumulate the matter and substance to reignite their spirits anew. Police Not slay bare the existential loneliness introduced to the human condition with unflinching despair. In this coldly clinical feature where humanity's reach has extended into the void, our isolation from each other, from any sense of purpose belonging, becomes inescapable. Jonathan Ingram emerges from a 27-year drift through the cosmic emptiness, literally hollowed out, a fragile cell of trophy humanity adrift amongst a civilization he no longer recognizes. His very existence has been surgically removed from the passage of time itself, leaving him without the intimate connections of family, friends, and personal milestones to ground his self-worth. Ingram's all-too-human search for reconnection is doomed, surrounded as he is imprisoned sterilely, technological progress marching violently on without him. Yet, he is far from alone in this psychic quarantine, whether it's a spiritually flawed Ed Brown, entitled with guilt over neglecting loved ones, or the luckless Karen Hojo, now orphaned and alone. Her very existence defined by a chronic illness, establishing permanent barriers to normality. In Police Not's bleak universe, the visceral vulnerability of our need for human intimacy is perverted into sickness, a fatal spiritual defect to be clinically dissected through the dehumanizing lens of science and corporate technoarchy. Kojima confronts us with the naked truth that all of our advanced expansion into space, our psychological continuity still stems from life's earliest evolutionary drive for tribal belonging. No distance we put between ourselves and our terrestrial origins can override hundreds of millennia of psychosocial conditioning towards the humanistic. We may physically occupy incomprehensibly vast realms, yet our primitive yearning for the profound solaces of love, purpose, and community remain frustratingly finite, leaving us emotionally adrift in the same paradoxical state cosmic loneliness. Perhaps it's this horror that Police Not timelessly warns us of, that in breaching of a final frontier we must take care not to lose only the frontier that ever truly matters. For if we surrender, 
the heart fires interpersonal connection into the vast interstellar night will have irreversibly abandoned our very souls to the same dread loneliness consuming Jonathan Holt. In conclusion, Police Now stands as a testament to Hideo Kojima's visionary storytelling and his ability to provoke introspection about the human condition within the context of futuristic sci-fi narrative. Through its exploration of themes such as loss, redemption, corruption, power, loneliness, and the passage of time, the game transcends the confines of this genre, offering players a profound and thought-provoking experience. By delving into the existential implications of humanity's expansions into space, Kojima challenges us to confront our deepest fears, desires, and vulnerabilities, urging us to contemplate the consequences of our actions and the choices we make as individuals, as a society. As we bid farewell to the world of police knots, we are left with a lingering sense of awe and wonder, as well as a renewed appreciation for the intricacies of the human nature, interconnectedness of our shared human experience. Through this unforgivable journey, Kojima reminds us that even the vast expanse of the cosmos, it's our humanity that ultimately defies who we are and shapes the course of our destiny. Beyond and the Earth are one thing. たとえどんなに離れていても地球との関係は不変なんだ子は親を踏み越えて成長していくが離れるわけじゃないんだ俺たちはいつも近くにいるいつも見守っている Police Knots offers a gameplay experience primarily driven by dialogue interactions and object interactions which some players may find as a major aspect of its charm or a drawback, depending on their preferences. Delving deep into the scientific terminology and explanations, the game immerses players in a meticulously crafted future world where fictional devices and medical procedures are explored with a touch of realism, while its scientific depth adds layers to the game's world and can be intellectually stimulating for those inclined towards science. It may not appeal to all players, particularly those less interested in scientific intricacies. The game's lengthy sequences, another point of contention for some players, contribute significantly to character development and storytelling. Rather than rushing through the game, Police Knots encourages players to savor each dialogue exchange, immersing themselves in the rich narrative tapestry. Approaching the game as a visual novel or interactive film to be savored over time echoes the overall experience, allowing players to appreciate the depth of the characters in their interactions. However, navigating through these tech sequences to progress the story can become tedious at times, requiring players to revisit dialogues multiple times to uncover information. In addition to dialogue-driven gameplay, Police Knots features puzzles and action sequences that break up the narrative flow, from diffusing bombs with a precise controller input to deciphering codes using a manual. These challenges offer a change of pace and require players to engage their problem-solving skills. While some puzzles may require external references or guides to solve, they add a variety to the gameplay experience. Voice dialogue segments and occasional animations further enhance the storytelling, providing moments of immersion amidst the text-heavy gameplay. With approximately seven chapters, Police Knots offers a substantial gameplay experience, with the first two chapters being the longest and most focused on investigation. Subsequent chapters feature anime sequences, dialogue exchanges, and arcade shooting sequences, balancing storytelling and action. Players willing to immerse themselves in the game's world and dialogue may find themselves spending upwards of 17 hours to complete the experience, while those opting to skip through the dialogue and expect shorter playtime of around 10 hours on average. Police notes embark on their journey across various platforms each port offering its own unique experience to players. The game initially debuted on the PC-9821 in July 1994, setting the stage for its subsequent adaptations. As technology evolved, Police Knots found its way onto different consoles, with ports for the 3DO Interactive Multiplayer, PlayStation, and Sega Saturn following suit. The 3DO version released in September 1995 introduced players to animated full motion videos, showcasing a departure from the static visuals of the PC version. However, subsequent console adaptations such as the PlayStation release in January 1996 faced some alterations, including adjustments to frame rates and the omission of certain story details. Despite these changes, 
Each iteration of Police Knots offered players a chance to immerse themselves in its rich narrative and intricate gameplay mechanics. Interestingly, Police Knots was on the cusp of making its way to North America, with an official English translation slated for release on the Sega Saturn in 1996. However, despite appearing in the promotional materials and generating considerable anticipation amongst fans, the localization never materialized. Various challenges, including technical hurdles and shifting industry trends, ultimately led to the product's cancellation. Yet, the legacy of Police Not persevered, fueled by the dedication of fans and enthusiasts. In 2009, a fan-trendly project breathed new life into the game, allowing English-speaking audiences to experience its captivating storyline and compelling characters firsthand. This grassroots effort underscored the enduring appeal of Police Knots and highlighted its significance within the gaming community. Police Knot garnered acclaim from critics upon its release, particularly in Japan where it was praised for its exceptional presentation. Sega Saturn Magazine and Famatsu lauded the game's captivating animation, immersive voice acting, and richly detailed setting liking it to an engrossing cinematic experience. While Sega Saturn Magazine commended its unique fusion of genres, it cautioned that the heavy scientific terminology might pose a challenge for some players. Nevertheless, both publications recommended Police Knots to fans of adventure games and anime, praising its hard boiled narrative and engaging gameplay. Despite its lack of official localization, Police Knots received attention from Western publications, with reviewers acknowledging its ambitious storytelling and technical achievements. Computer and video games previewed the 3DO version, lauded its intriguing plot and inventive characters. Game fan reviewing the PlayStation and Saturn ports hailed Police Knots as a masterful achievement, applauding its intricate detail and suspenseful storytelling. They acknowledged the game's emphasis on text over action, yet deemed it a worthwhile experience for players seeking a rich narrative. In retrospect reviews, Police Knots continued to impress critics with its writing and presentation. The game's cinematic influences, particularly nods to science fiction and buddy cop films, were widely noted, with comparisons drawn to classic movies like Luke the Weapon. Critics praised Kojima's meticulous attention to detail, especially in describing futuristic technologies and everyday items. While some critics found fault with the game's pacing and occasional sexual humor, Many praised the deep cinematic aspiration and strong characterization. Despite its flaws, Police Not stands as a testament to Kojima's vision and storytelling prowess, captivating players with its compelling narrative and immersive world building. Its enduring legacy speaks to its status as a cult classic, cherished by fans for its unique blend of science fiction, noir, and interactive storytelling. Playing Police Knots for the first time was truly an unforgettable experience for me. It reshaped my perspective on space exploration, organ transplants, and even the passage of time itself. Like its predecessor, Snatcher, Police Knots offered a unique blend of storytelling and interactivity, blurring the lines between gaming and cinema. While the game's low interactivity nature may initially seem daunting, it ultimately serves to immerse players deeply into its intricate narrative. Admittedly, Police Knots isn't without its flaws. The abundance of information can sometimes feel overwhelming, and the constant clicking through text boxes can be exhausting. Yet, despite these minor setbacks, the game's compelling character development and thought-provoking themes more than make up for it. Themes of time, loneliness, and corruption premeditate the narrative, lending a Shakespearean depth that transcends the confines of traditional video games. Hideo Kojima's masterful direction guides players through a captivating roller coaster of emotions, ensuring that each moment is rich with meaning and significance. Police Knots marks a pivotal moment in Kojima's career, propelling him from a mere developer to a visionary storyteller. Its influence on his future projects cannot be overstated, shaping the trajectory of his creative endeavors for years to come. As a fan of retro games, Kojima, or immersive narratives, I wholeheartedly recommend taking time to experience Police Knots. It may reside in the shadows of cult classics, but its impact on gaming history and storytelling is undeniable. Police Knots is more than just a game. It's a testament to the power of storytelling and the enduring legacy of one of gaming's greatest visionaries. If you made it this far, I want to thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel for more content like this. Hit the notification bell to stay up to date on all our latest uploads. 
If you have any retrospective requests or suggestions, feel free to drop them in the comment section below. This is the Retro Phantom, signing out.